Hello, my name is Brian De Silva, uh, class of 2012 of Arts and Sciences, and I'm happy to welcome you to this Doors and Dialogue session. I'm here representing LAVA, the LGBTQIA plus Association of Vanderbilt alumni, whose mission is to advance activities and outreach that strengthen community and connectedness and generate resources to support students personally, academically, and professionally, and to assist the Vanderbilt Alumni Association in making its networks a welcoming and robustly inclusive community. Um, I'll introduce Stephanie Mankey, who will be moderating our session. Originally from Riverside, California, Stephanie Staff Mankey joined the Vanderbilt community as the director for LGBTQI life in January of 2022. Prior to arriving at Vanderbilt, Steph worked as an assistant professor in English and literature at Utah Valley University. She graduated with her bachelor's degree at the University of California, Los Angeles, her master's degree at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and her PhD in writing, rhetoric, and American cultures at Michigan State University. Drawing from her research in cultural rhetorics, community engagement, and digital humanities, Steph has worked extensively with cultural centers and nonprofits on project and programmatic development that center digital literacy and equity, cultural heritage preservation, and diverse cultural conceptions of gender and sexuality. Steph? Hey, thanks, Brian. Um, so again, yeah, my name is Steph. She are her pronouns. Uh, I'm the director of the Casey Potter Center, uh, and this houses the Office of Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Queer, and Intersex Life at Vanderbilt. Um, this is also a cultural center that serves as an affirming space for individuals uh, of all identities. It's also a resource um, for those who want information and support around gender and sexuality. And because everyone has their own journey around gender and sexuality, um, that's why we say we serve all members of the Vanderbilt community. Um, so this includes students, staff, and alumni, uh, as well as faculty. Occasionally we serve members of Middle Tennessee, um, and we also partner with several community organizations that serve the wider LGBTQIA plus community. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be moderating this panel today. Um, so for today, we're gonna be talking about the economic cost of injustice, particularly toward those in the LGBTQIA plus community. And you know, when we talk about the impact of discrimination, it, it's often through a sociocultural or ethical lens. Um, and, but today we're more so focusing on the economic and financial impact and, and economic and currency being defined as our panelists would you know, like to define that as well. Um, and sometimes in EDI work, we, we consider this the business case for why we work to reduce discrimination and build more equitable structures. Uh, and though I wanna preface, it's not the only compelling reason for EDI, it's certainly a very considerable one. Um, and so we have two amazing panelists today to help us navigate this topic. I'll go ahead and introduce each of them. Uh, and then we're gonna hear a little bit about their experience, uh, their relation to this topic and what they do at Vanderbilt. And then we'll go ahead and move into some questions. Um, so the first person I want to introduce is Dr. Christopher Kit Carpenter, uh, Professor Carpenter, he, him pronouns, is a health and labor economist who studies the effects of public policies on health and family outcomes. At Vanderbilt, he is the founder and director of the TIP-supported Vanderbilt LGBTQ plus policy lab, the director of the program in public policy studies, and the faculty facilitator for Q&A, which is the Queer and Asian Affinity Group. Carpenter is the director of the NBER Health Economics Program. He's editor at the Journal of Health Economics, a member of the National Advisory Council for the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, vice president of the Southern Economic Association, a member of the board of directors of the American Society of Health Economists, and co-founder and co-chair of the American Economic Association's Committee on the Status of LGBTQ plus Individuals in the Economics Profession. For his contributions to EDI at Vanderbilt, Dr. Carpenter was named the 2021-22 Joseph A. Johnson Jr. Distinguished Leadership Professor. He has published widely on the effects of legal same-sex marriage, the causes and consequences of youth substance use, and the effects of public policies on health behaviors such as bicycle helmet use, seatbelt use, smoking, cancer screening, and vaccination. Carpenter's research has been continuously supported by the National Institutes of Health, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the American Cancer Society. So Kit, welcome. First off, do you sleep ever? <laughs> and secondly, could you tell us a little bit about your time at Vanderbilt and your connection to this topic and maybe about the, your policy lab? 
Sure. Thanks, Steph. Uh, it's great to be here with you um, and my colleague, Masha. Um, I apologize for all of that, um, making you read all of that horribly uh, boring introduction, um, but it is a highlight reel of the things that I'm really passionate about, which is and pulls me in lots of different directions. Um, but at the very top of that list is this thing that I'm wearing a shirt about and this thing that I have a water ball on my desk about, which is uh, the creation of the LGBTQ plus policy lab here at Vanderbilt. So I've been um, here for a decade. I'm from Michigan and I did my PhD. Um, I went to a small liberal arts college in Michigan and did my PhD in economics at Berkeley. Um, Berkeley has a long tradition of being the place where like misfits and outcasts go to school, uh, both for undergrad and for PhD. Um, and it produces like an, an, a shockingly high share of queer economists in the profession. Um, and I'm one of those. Um, and I started my career at the University of Michigan and a postdoc um, and then uh, was on faculty at the business school at UC Irvine for a decade decade before I was recruited here to Vanderbilt and I've been here for a decade um, and my husband and I love it uh, here and we love Vanderbilt and it's uh, been a great place to build a career. One of the reasons why it's been so great is because of the freedom to um, do things that uh, I'm passionate about to study our community. Um, so creating this policy lab. So the the phrase that you may have heard in, in Steph's description is it's a TIPS supported policy lab. So TIPS uh, was this program that our pro former provost and chancellor started. Um, uh, the trans institutional programs. It's based us on this idea that kind of big societal problems will not be answered just by economists or just by sociologists or just by physicians, but rather we need people working across disciplines and boundaries. Um, and so we pitched this idea that we wanted to, especially in the US South, especially in Tennessee, understand what causes different places to have different policy regimes and stances towards their treatment of queer people and what are the effects of those policies and regimes and stances on the health, well-being, lived experience, flourishing ability of queer people and broadly defined relative to cisgender heterosexual people. Um, and so that's what we've done in the last five years and that's what we'll continue to do for hopefully the next 50, which is bring together scholarship from economics, sociology, health services, epidemiology, um, uh, anthropology, all the major social sciences, and then we branch out to our uh, uh, sisters across campus in divinity, in education, in health policy, in medicine, in law, um, to really kind of get at uh, queer well-being from a policy lens from lots of different perspectives. Um, and so we've hired, we have what, five tenure track faculty, we'll be hiring more, we have bunches of postdocs running around. We have graduate students that we train. We have loads and loads of undergraduates, which is a real joy. Um, and we're right in the heart of the historic core. So, um, you know, I'm hoping that there's a lot of queer alums on this call or who will watch this later. Um, we're in third floor Butcher Call, which is right in the historic core, a floor below the dean's office. So if you're on campus for homecoming, if you're in, just in town for you know a, a, an alum weekend, um, you should come by. We have a mailing list. Um, we have seminars. You know, we're kind of, uh, we take all comers and we'd love to have uh, alum involvement. Um, and the bread and butter of what we do is kind of well-being broadly defined of queer folks. But my specific area of emphasis as an economist is understanding kind of, you know, how are the wages, the employment, the economic and financial well-being of queer people relative to cisgender heterosexual people? So um, I won't have all of the answers nearly at anywhere close to all of the answers for today, but I'm I'm excited to talk about some different research and perspectives that I've been had the privilege of doing um, since I've been here at Vanderbilt. Thanks. Nice. Yeah, I love how interdisciplinary your work is, has been and all the work that you do in your policy lab as well. So we're really lucky to have you, Kit. Thank you. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Masha Tatova. Uh, Professor Tatova, she, her pronouns, is a theorist interested in information economics, political economy, and industrial organization. Her research focuses on strategic settings in which agents have imperfect information. She analyzes how informed agents influence uninformed decision makers, or you know, how politicians persuade voters, and investigates how agents learn or how lawmakers identify the best available policies. Now, before moving to Vanderbilt, Professor Tatova completed a PhD at the University of California, San Diego Department of Economics in 2021, where her advisors were Renee Bowen and Joel Sobel. She also holds a master's in science in financial economics and a bachelor's in science in applied mathematics and information science from the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, Russia. Welcome, Masha. Can you tell us a little bit about your time and your work here at Vanderbilt? Um, right, thank you, Steph. Uh, so yeah, all of the above is true. Uh, I've been, I'm one of the 
uh, most recent hires of the economics department. So I've been here just over a year. Um, I'm also affiliated with the political science department. So I was actually one of the interdisciplinary hires that Kip was talking about. Um, like my position is, I think intended partially to sort of bridge the gap between economics and political science. Um, you know, uh, maybe we're going to create like a political economy minor. Um, and yeah, uh, it's all about um, bridging gaps here. Um, so uh, yeah, um, I, I'm a theorist, so I'm kind of a glorified mathematician. Uh, I don't know much about the real world. I've been in school my whole entire life and Hopefully that would just keep happening. Uh, if I'm lucky, I'll just stay in school forever. Um, but um, yeah, I'm a micro uh, microeconomist. That's what it's called, uh, which means that I like um, I study individual decision making, and uh, in particular, um, what interests me the most at the moment is how people learn uh, and how people persuade other people. Uh, and, you know, like, of course, that's um, that's really relevant for elections. That's really relevant for policies. Um, my my research is not directly um, um, related to sort of the LGBTQ plus community. But of course, uh, you know, the arguments I make in my papers uh, could be of use to the community. And I just wanted to add a little bit about how distinguished Kid is. He was talking mostly about his policy lab, but actually he does a lot of work within the economics profession. And that's actually how I found out that Vanderbilt was even hiring for my position. It was from Kit uh, through, through the Committee on the Status of the LGBTQ Individuals in the Economics Profession. So yeah, thank you, Kit. You're very welcome. We're so happy to, lucky to have you here. Yeah, thanks, Masha. And I, can I just say, I'm going to follow up every bio with like, it's true. It's true. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So it was to, true. Or, what's that? It was what? true. Mm -hmm. um, so to get started, I thought we might begin with uh, injustice and its economic impact in terms of the micro or the individual level first. Uh, and then we're going to move over to the macro. So looking at overall how discrimination can affect the success of a company, organization, and just broader economy. Um, I love that both of you have such strong backgrounds in policy and how that impacts folks in the real world. Um, so we'll get to talk about that. And then I think we'll aim to end on some takeaways, like some things we can do as individuals to make our own impact against some of the economic trends and outcomes that we discuss today. Um, so to start us off, just what are some, some grounding examples, both positive and negative, of how individual decisions can affect the LGBTQIA plus community, and then how might this have economic consequences? And this is for both of you. Masha, would you like to go first, or would you like me to? Um, I could go first by making a really general statement, which is, I think, every single decision literally everybody makes affects literally everything. So um, just to like narrow it down a little bit, I think uh, everything, especially like we as members of the community, like everything we do has an impact. Uh, and what we can do is try to make that impact positive. And I think some of the members, uh, you know, have more of an impact, more of more power, others have less power, you know, like the more kind of distinguished you are, uh, probably the more impact you're going to have. Uh, and then, you know, to quote Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. And so we should just be really, really responsible uh, of our actions because actually we're not just, you know, people trying to live our lives. We are also representing the community. So in a sense, there is um, pressure on us, on every member of the community to represent it. Yeah. I totally agree. And let me segue in a totally different direction because I was thinking about the question. Uh, so I agree with everything that's been said, but I was um, thinking about um, trying to give a social science, how social scientists and economists think about whether there's discrimination against individuals. So 
lots of different ways of knowing in social science, you know, you can talk to people and do qualitative work and they can tell you about just horrific examples of microaggression or like harassment, discrimination, physical uh, assault, etc. So we know from individuals physical uh, uh, verbal accounts that um, discrimination exists and um, is, is you know, super uh, uh, important phenomenon. The one thing that uh, those of us that are more, uh, we're trained in a different tradition, um, you know, I sit around with computers and data all day and just like run regressions, uh, basically play around with statistics all day. Um, and there are other ways that um, social scientists uh, have to document discrimination as well. Um, so I, for example, use survey data or administrative data on people's wages and their earnings from tax records, from how much they tell survey respondents they make at work, um, and those types of sources. And the stylized fact in all of this work is that um, discrimination, <laughs> shocking, is that discrimination <laughs> exists, i.e. Um, in particular, it's a little bit nuanced, but gay men in particular um, have significantly worse economic outcomes than similarly situated um, heterosexual men. And the key words there are similarly situated. So as economists, what we really want to know is, are people paid the same for their skills, um, for their characteristics, or are they paid differently? And the way that you know that is you take tons and tons of people and you aggregate across those people and you figure out these people with these characteristics, this much education, this much experience, these racial demographics, these marital statuses, et cetera. Uh, when you have enough people and enough observations about their wages, you can kind of credibly identify which of the, um, uh, you know, which characteristics are associated with which um, uh, uh, economic outcomes, for example. And that literature across place, across time, across any setting shows clearly that gay men do worse than straight men. Um, for Sexual minority women, it's actually a mixed bag, um, and there's lots of evidence, and we can talk about that later if people are interested in it. Um, but but unambiguously, gay men do worse, um, and uh, I think the literature broadly thinks that that's just animus. Part of that is just animus towards gay men. Like historically, the people who are in charge of wage setting, in charge of making employment decisions, like have a particular aversion to gay men. Those people are generally men, generally heterosexual men. And lots of other research shows that um, heterosexual men in particular have a th are threatened by um, gay men in the workplace, for example. Um, so that literature is quite unambiguous. Um, there's another strand of literature um, in social science that uses experiments of um, basically fake people applying to real jobs. Um, so the way that this works is um, a, a, a researcher will um, take a bunch of resumes of people that are fictional and they will send those same resumes to real jobs. Um, and the resumes will be identical except for one characteristic. And on this fake resume, it will say that the candidate was the president of their undergraduate LGBTQ organization. And on this resume, it'll say that their candidate was the president of Habitat for Humanity or some other you know, lefty uh, organization. And this candidate who doesn't exist gets far fewer callbacks for interviews, i.e. the president of the Lambda organization doesn't get called by the employer at the same rate as this candidate. So, you know, in these very well controlled experiments, and these types of experiments have been done across every city in the United States, across every like developed country in the world, they show very, you know, there's this literature is a bit of a drag because you're kind of like, okay, we get it. Uh, there's an, you know, people don't like to uh, treat gay people nicely in the workplace. Um, and that all of that literature really shows very clear evidence that um, uh, queer folks are treated worst. I haven't talked about trans folks they are not surprisingly also struggling very substantially. That literature is far less developed than for uh, LGNB folks due to data limitations, but all evidence that we have shows that um, trans folks uh, and, and uh, all, in general, non cisgender folks, so including non binary folks, including um, uh, gender queer folks, for example, those folks are again, compared to similarly situated cisgender folks, they have lower incomes, lower employment rates, more poverty, more food insecurity, more um, rental ins housing instability. Um, uh, so it's it's kind of a want-want to get this started, but like there's lots of it, all the evidence uh, points towards quite a bit of um, economic challenges with, with some subset of that evidence pointing to direct discrimination by employers. 
Yeah, so so we're seeing already just the ability to get a job is already hampered there too. So wages, so I'm assuming too, the same with salaries, promotions, uh, probably equally at a disadvantage here. Um, yeah, and you're not even, you weren't even touching on what happens once they're in the job, right? We get the microaggressions or harassment, which you sort of uh, touched on in the beginning a little bit here. And I want to go back to sort of Masha's statement too about being also aware of the level of power an individual might have in terms of their responsibility and the impact that they could have on, on LGBTQIA folks in the work in the workforce. Um, so I kind of want to move to that notion of that power, that responsibility, uh, you know, hitting a wide net of the community in terms of laws. So how, how do we see laws impacting and perpetuating discrimination and sort of further affecting these economic consequences? Kit, you want to make me, you want me to make another general statement? Please, you... I would love for you to do that. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, another general statement, which um, could be obvious, but I don't know, is I think laws really help um, kind of put the society on the same page. Like, it's kind of like a focal point for what the correct opinion is at the moment, right? So for example, if we're talking about gay marriage, um once it was legalized it's it's almost like you're in the wrong now if you don't support it whereas like a year before that you know it was really unclear who was wrong and who was right so i think laws actually um they have a, a lot bigger impact than actually legalizing the uh, intended Thing that they're supposed to legalize so definitely laws um laws are extremely extremely important and so it's like it's extremely upsetting that a lot of them are now uh, under question yeah yeah i totally agree and some of my own work has really empirically documented that fact that masha just described which is that laws serve this legitimacy function of actually like setting the tone of the discussion about what is acceptable and what is not acceptable um it, we've seen that in um studies that looked at the uh the way that same-sex marriage percolated throughout the united states and the way that it percolated throughout uh, western europe in particular what you see is that people's attitudes about gay people actually improved following legalization of same-sex relationships. There's this million-dollar question in social science, which is whether attitudes cause laws or whether laws cause attitudes or both. And it's a very difficult to uh, disentangle those, but through a variety of kind of interesting empirical designs that leverage um, kind of across space and across time variation and the timing of different policy reforms, um, some work that I and others have done have suggested that uh, there it could be the case that attitudes cause laws, but it's also the case that laws cause attitudes, i.e. improvements in policies towards um, sexual and gender minorities actually do improve people's um, uh, evaluation of them. So these are based on questions like, would you like to have, how would you feel if you had a, a gay person as a neighbor? How much shame do you think it would bring to a family if they found out their kid was gay, right? So there is an enormous amount of variation across that in the world um, and a, across countries, within countries at a point in time, but, um, the research shows that beneficial policies improve attitudes um, stated by the majority, which is mostly cisgender and heterosexual people um, about queer people. Um, the other thing I'll note, so it, is that like laws are especially important and relevant in the context of the previous conversation we were just having in the context of discrimination due to a surprise Supreme Court ruling two summers ago during the COVID pandemic um, in Bostock versus Clayton County. So um, right prior to, we all woke up in summer 2020, this was the Supreme Court case where um, uh, uh, Justice Gorsuch basically said that because of sex means that sex discrimination statutes in the United States, if, if an employer discriminates, um, uh, you know, if if Kit is discriminated because he's with Clayton and he wouldn't have been if if he were with Masha, then he is discriminated against because of sex, i.e. sexual orientation discrimination is by construction sex discrimination, and also gender identity discrimination is by construction sex discrimination. You can't uh, unlink those two concepts. And because sex discrimination is illegal and has been so for decades, queer people 
are now protected by under federal employment non-discrimination law. So these discussions, um, you know, it's too early to tell, I would say, about kind of what will be effect, the effect of that surprise 2020 Supreme Court ruling, which like was great for queer people, notwithstanding everything that Masha said, which earlier, which is totally true. Lots of other rights are on the chopping block. Um, the most recent summer Supreme Court case in Dobbs, uh, you know, has a has a dissent that quite clearly calls out same-sex marriage as a decision that Justice Thomas thinks was decided incorrectly. Um, all of that is absolutely true, but, uh, you know, it is, I think it's useful to point out that there have been some big wins um, in the, for queer people in the not recent past, um, and we need to study those more to understand kind of what will be the effects of, of say, Bostock on uh, hiring, firing, wages, promotions, happiness at work, harassment, you know, all of these important outcomes. Yeah, definitely. I, I love this connection here between the attitudes and laws and how they're sort of interconnected here. It's not so black and white. Um, when we talk about, you know, I think discrimination now happening in, in businesses and in organizations, um, uh, do we have an example of how that might impact the success of a particular group, a uh, particular business? Um, yeah, does that make sense? It, yeah. It does. And I'll pause here to see if Masha wants to go first. Two, or if you want to reverse order this time um we can reverse order yeah okay so i'll, I'll just give you a con i'm not going to call out a specific business but i'll just give you a concrete example of how historic of how typically we as labor economists think about this um affecting companies so here's a very concrete example if if a gay person has to hide their sexuality at work they are generally less productive. Why? Because it's harder to like make widgets or send emails or work in Excel when I have to like police my words and my behavior and what photos I have up on my desk to, to wonder if my colleagues, my, my superiors are thinking of me differently or, you know, parsing my words or listening to my pronouns or who, who I spent time with over the weekend, et cetera. All of that is time and energy. So A, that's deleterious to the individual because it's like mentally taxing and stressful. Stressful, but B, it's deleterious to the firm because that is time that they could have spent being more productive. Um, all of the research, there's a whole group of um, studies in management science that shows quite clearly that um, in addition to the that phenomenon that I just explained, which I think is a very concrete example, there's another strand of literature that I think is really relevant here. And that research shows quite clearly that diverse teams are just more productive. Um, so that's diversity, not just respect, with respect to sexual orientation and gender identity, but like diversity, diversity broadly defined. And the idea, the fundamental idea is like different people think about how to tackle solutions to problems differently. And if you have a really hard problem, the that you it's difficult to solve, the more different angles that you can come at it from, the more likely you are to reach a, a conclusion or a, a productive solution to that problem. So bringing in different perspectives, which, you know, whether that be uh, queer people, whether that be women, whether that be African Americans, for example, disabled folks, um, all, all of that would be um, kind of, uh, this is research that experimentally manipulates um, uh, the presence of different dis diverse groups within teams, which experimentation is kind of the gold standard within social science of kind of how we how we think we know what we know. So you take an ex a team over here where you've experimentally manipulated it to have like all cishet white guys, or you have a team over here where you've like randomly dropped in like black folks and queer folks, etc. And this team just outperforms the 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 other team. Um, and so I think those are two examples of pieces of evidence where um, it really matters in the workplace. Right. I was, um, okay, so Kit was talking about diversity in organizations, like at a workplace. Uh, and I think I want to just draw a little bit of attention to like the other side, which is discrimination and like not in a workplace but the, by by like businesses so say i don't know the remember the story where like a gay couple was trying to buy a cake and they couldn't um i think like if a business sort of openly uh discriminates against somebody who's visibly i don't know visibly queer um Kind of two effects take place. So one is they they risk um, they risk losing customers who are aligned with the LGBTQ community, but at the same time they also gain a lot of customers who are 
sort of on the other side, All right? So it's almost like picking a side in a war. So just if you look at that, it's actually unclear to me in the short run, at least, like whether, you know, they're gonna make more or, or less money. So I don't think it's, at least in the short run, it's like not really that easy of a question. But I think if you do look over the longer run, um, you know, those businesses are probably not gonna do as well. But, you know, then at the same time, we have a lot of like really large corporations who have been known to be associated uh, with, um, with homophobia, who, who have known to be giving money to uh, people, you know, doing everything to pass laws um, um, sort of against the LGBTQ community. And those businesses seem to be doing fine. So just like on the business side, I think a lot, a lot more research should be done to actually, actually measure, like, how discriminating customers actually affects affects your businesses long term, especially if it's like lawful, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love how Masha points out this is this is very complicated. There's a lot of different factors to keep in mind too, in terms of like how it shakes out economically. And I, Masha, as soon as you were talking, I was thinking immediately of the example of Disney and losing that tax status in Florida, right? And then they were getting a lot of heat from their own workers. They were getting a lot of heat from lawmakers as well. And so you can see this shaking out differently for for their customer base um, as well. Uh, and then you know, kind of going back to Kit, I do want to stop a moment to talk about you know, Kit, you mentioned the sort of psychological bandwidth that it takes takes to sort of carry, you know, these, these ideas of, you know, am I, am I seeming out to like the sort of things you have to hide in the workplace, the lower productivity that that kind of causes. And then going back to your earlier discussion too, about, uh, you know, just the higher levels of poverty as well. Uh, just really quickly, are you seeing sort of health disparities sort of hand in hand uh, going along the, the economic cost of what's, you know, how this is affecting the LGBT community as well. And I know the policy lab kind of focuses on health. Yeah. That's yeah. our bread and butter. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Um, and the answer is yes. And like, tragically, it's way bigger. So um, it's much more severe. It's much more pervasive. Um, and it is just jumps off the page. So my colleagues here at the Policy Lab, I'm a health economist. The people whose real bread and butter it, it is, is like my colleague Gilbert Gonzalez, who's a health services researcher and public health scholar. Um, Chris, my colleague, Kirsty Clark, who is a social and psychiatric epidemiologist. My colleague, Tara McKay, who is a, a sociology uh, sociologist who studies um, uh, older populations, older queer populations. Um, they could put up any number of slides, which would just take your breath away about the magnitude of the disparities associated with L, G, B, T, and Q status. And there some maybe that I'm not sure, depending on what your prior is, would really surprise you. So like, for example, the B disparities are so robust, wildly robust disparities for bisexual people. And bisexual people, if you did not know this, are like the largest by demographic sexual minority group among the LGBTQ. And they are also um, some of the most harmed in terms of, um, you know, many people think that that's because of double discrimination, right? They are discriminated against by heterosexual folks. They are not really welcomed within the L and the G only group. Um, and so they might be um, particularly marginalized. Many of them are in different sex relationships. And so, um, you you know, they don't, it's hard for them to celebrate big wins, like same-sex marriage, for example, because like they are observed, people observe them to be observationally in different sex relationships and thus presumed to be heterosexual. Um, but the B uh, uh, health disparities are, are quite big and the T ones are uh, enormous and, and very troubling. And these range not just from um, preventive care and cardiovascular health and that kind of thing, but the really bad things like suicidality, not that those other things aren't bad, but suicidality, substance use, depression, anxiety, um, you know, things that are, can be very acute, land you um, in a hospital or a morgue, um, are, are especially problematic for uh, queer folks. And, and we haven't, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to think about the interconnected links between health and economic uh, 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 condition or economic outcome. Comes, um, I think it's clearly multi-directional and multi-dimensional, right? It's it's hard to be productive if you have mental health challenges, and uh, no money to pay rent can certainly make you depressed. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, 
So I, yeah, I guess the next question then is, and I think this question kind of gets to the notion of, is this getting better at all? Do you think businesses are aware of the negative financial impact that this discrimination can cause? Are we moving in, in, in a good direction here? What do y'all think? Kit, you have the data. Okay, I will go first. I would say it's hit or miss. There are some days where there's like, wow, look at all those wins. And then some days where it's like, Ugh, um, not so good. So for example, Bostock was a big win. Nobody expected Bostock to come. And so everyone is like, I think very hopeful about like what that might portend for queer people. Um, you know, the ability the ability to file a lawsuit or file a claim because you think you have been discriminated against because of your sexual orientation and gender identity and or gender identity. And I want to be clear, like it's not costless and it's hard. So those claims can be hard to prove. But, bef but before Bostock, half the country literally did not even have the legal right, right? You could have been fired just because an employer says, no, I don't like your kind, goodbye. Um, and now you can, now there's federal employment protection. So I'm excited about that. Um, I'm thinking back to, you know, uh, the state of Tennessee had this law that said you, if you had a gender neutral restroom or if you allowed people to use the restroom according to their uh, gender identity, you had to put up a sign on your front door um, telling folks, right, so, uh, that, that you did that. And that caused quite a hubbub. Um, and uh, I think if I remember correctly, the reason that that was eventually um, kind of injuncted or whatever the legal term is, is because firms, progressive firms said things like, that's forcing me to advertise against my core values and you cannot force me to do that, which seemed like an interesting, uh, to a non-lawyer, seemed like a very interesting legal argument that turned out to be, um, uh, that turned out to be effective. Um, back to your question about, um, uh, you know, uh, the Disney thing, uh, I would say that it, it certainly brings to mind like the North Carolina bathroom bill um, back several years ago now, which um, HB2, I think it was called, there was a lot of hubbub about that. It caused, you know, big concerts to pull out of the stadiums, it caused uh, big sporting events to move their location, et cetera, et cetera. So, in some sense, you might think those of those as wins. Um, I do think that, as Tamasha's point made earlier, it's very hard to know empirically if those things really, um, if those things had long lasting large scale effects. And I am not familiar with any research that has really credibly shown that to be true. Certainly, there are very high profile instances of the NCAA or the NBA finals or something like that pulling out of a state. Um, and that's super relevant for the state of Tennessee. Um, you may recall uh, Amazon placing its headquarters, right? There was a number one distribution facility and then like a baby number two. And where was that going to go? Was it going to go Atlanta? Was it going to go Nashville? Was it going to go New York? A um, lot of discussions there about uh, Amazon being a pretty lefty leaning uh, progressive company with progressive values. Um, you know, what would it mean for them to choose a state like Tennessee, which has a pretty aggressively anti LGBTQ agenda? What would that mean for their workers? Um, what kind of signals does that send? What does it mean for their queer workers? Um, is it good for their, is it actually a win because, you know, they can do more good in the state by, by locating here, or is it bad because of um, the, the social structures that it supports? So I don't have a great answer for you um, about, is it getting better? I would say the data, as to Masha's point, I do have the data and attitudes are clearly getting better in the population unambiguously. Like if you just look at shares of people who like those questions that I was talking about before, um, what would, would you be, have a problem supporting a gay neighbor or having a gay kid? unambiguously, you know, do, do you know somebody who is trans or non-binary? All of those things are like off the charts, kind of clearly increasing in part because um, of demographics and aging, right? Like what one thing we know about the queer community, especially the non-binary community, is that it's disproportionately a younger community. So as the population ages, things are just attitudes are just going to keep getting better and better and better and better. As to your specific question about business wins, I think it's a mixed bag. It, there are as many days, I think, when you look at the paper or the internet and you're like, oh, that's horrific, um, as kind of are good. Right. Hey, Masha, did you want to add to that one? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so I think that like uh, when, when we're talking about like whether things are getting better, it's important to like keep the specific timeline in mind. So like things are like definitely 100% better than they were like in the 70s, 80s, 90s, probably early 2000s too. Whether things are better today than they were yesterday, I don't know, right? But like, <clears throat> of course, uh, as like, as we fight for our rights, there would be days, months, and maybe even years uh, where 
uh, you know, once like two steps forward, one step step back, like surely we will go back in some things. But um, I do think that overall things are definitely getting better. That said, of course, there's there is a lot of discrimination happening within organizations, within businesses, and a lot of it is, I think, like not even on people's radar at all. Like I, I bet, like businesses have no idea that, like for example, you know, you're you're filling out a form. And it asks for your gender and it's like male or female. Like that's discrimination. Like probably you don't even, shouldn't even ask, but like if you do, you know, have a third option. Or like uh, just yesterday I was buying a plane ticket and it asked for my title. And those were gendered as well. Like I have a PhD, so I could just pick a doctor, but also like I'm not in binary. But if I were like, that's like a microaggression and it's like, why do you care about my title in the first place? So there's, um, you know, we were talking about like this, this really big picture stuff the, throughout this panel, but there's actually a lot of really small things um, and a lot of them. And they do also have economic like consequences when you aggregate them. So uh, yeah, actually businesses do have a lot of growing to do probably even on really small scale, even the really well-meaning ones. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, and Masha, that, I think that perfectly segues us into, you know, what can we do as, as individuals, um, you know, in, in terms of uh, keeping this younger generation's momentum going, uh, you know, and then Kate was also mentioning these attitudes are certainly improving. So what can we do as individuals to make a difference with this problem? Are there actionable steps, um, especially as I imagine there's some students listening to this uh, who are going to be entering the workforce or going to be entering the professional world and the alumni who are already in their the sort of respective um, working environments, what can we do from here? Masha, first, you want to go first or second? Um, I can start, then you can go, and then if I have anything else, I could add more. Yeah, I, I think like I, I just want to go back to like the one of the first things that I said that we we represent the community. So like we we should keep doing that. Like we should um, we should definitely, you know, share our experiences uh, and educate those who want to be educated, All right? So we, like these days we learn in, uh, we live in a very polarized society and, uh, you know, people kind of just consume the media that that aligns with them. And it's just very easy to exist in this like liberal bubble where like all your friends are queer and it's like, you know, there's like sunshine and rainbows, but the truth is there's a lot of people who just don't know about our problems, who don't know uh, about the discrimination. And like, maybe if they did know, they could actually, you know, vote uh, certain ways or change certain behaviors. So I think it, it is very important not to get like too, I don't know, radicalized. Um, it's important to keep the dialogue with people who disagree with you. Uh, even if that may seem unpleasant, uh, but it is important to, you know, remember that we're not just part of the community, the LGBTQ community, we're also part of the bigger society. <laughs> and there are other people in that society who also affect um, which laws, which laws uh, you know, would come into place and so on. Um, it's so fun doing this with Masha because I wouldn't have thought to say any of the responses you've given, but they're so good. So um, thank, I'm really thankful for the opportunity to do this with you. So I would say um, I would go in two uh, related but different directions. So one is, you know, notwithstanding all of the excitement about Bostock, which I think is pretty exciting. Well, actually, let me start with a, a study that um, I had the privilege of working on recently um, where we found something that kind of knocked my socks off. So we did this online experiment uh, using a nationally representative online sample of like 1800 people in the United States. And we asked them about their knowledge of different non discrimination protections, we said, like, which of these groups do you think has federal non discrimination protection, African Americans, women, and so what you find is that people get it right for like the ones that everyone knows, which is like race, 
uh, women, uh, disabled people, you, you people get that right. People don't get it right that sexual orientation and gender identity are covered, in part because maybe Bostock is quite recent. But the, the, the thing that I think shocked me the most uh, is that um, there was no difference between queer people and straight people in their knowledge about <laughs> protections in employment on the basis of sexual orientation gender identity that is to say queer people don't know that they're protected at rates they know they 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 are as likely to not know as straight people and um that seems like wrong like we should do something about that we should have an information campaign where we inform queer people like at a minimum you need to know that you have the right to file a lawsuit or file a claim with the Empl equal employment opportunity commission if in fact somebody has harassed you or discriminated against you so partly there's that partly it's like go tell it on the mountain like yes there is federal protection this is a new regime we should exercise our rights there's the flip side of that is that this is pretty well known, but we need to, you know, make people aware that Bostock has huge limitations. It does not cover education. It does not cover housing. It does not cover health care. It is perfectly legal to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity in everything other than employment. Now, employment is a big deal, but so are all of those other aspects of life, right, that, that I just said. So the Equality Act would kind of cover all of those other things. And so one, one thing that like Vanderbilt alums, for example, could do is like, right, you know, this is sounds trite, but like, right, you're a local congressperson and like really support the Equality Act. Um, uh, that is a thing that I think would um, extend protections. Um, I think the the other thing, and I this is very salient to me when I um, teach my undergraduate course in causes and consequences of LGBTQ public policies. The other thing that's very salient in the United States is that um, where you live matters tremendously, um, unless you have resources. And if you have, this is true generally about inequality in the United States and in the world, I think. But like, if you have resources to a first order approximation you're fine. Like you can travel out of state to do a lot of things. And this might be true for reproductive freedom and for lots of other things, but it's, it's also true for, for queer rights, right? So like, if you looked at any map of where the policies for queer folks are the worst, it's in the South. It's like right here in Tennessee. It's all throughout our, you know, uh, the bordering states. Um, but for those of us that work at Vanderbilt or Vanderbilt alums, like you're, you'll probably be, uh, I'm not discounting your experiences of harassment or discrimination, like all of those are bad, but like on a broad scale, you can, for example, start a family, you can do all of these other things. But if you are poor, or if you are young in a state where you don't have control over the curriculum that you receive, whether or not you can participate in the gay straight alliance, whether or not, you know, people can call you names without any, uh, or hurt you uh, without any uh, recourse, those things are pretty horrific. Um, and we know that those things lead to really, really bad outcomes for kids. And so um, for those of us that are fortunate enough to um, have resources, I think really recognizing that the geography of the, the luck and unluck of where you were born matters enormously, especially for queer people and for people at the intersections of queer and black or queer and any other marginalized group. So, you know, donate to the Trevor Project is a very cheap and easy, excuse me, not cheap. You should donate a lot of money to the Trevor Project. Donate to the Trevor Project is one thing you can do. Donate to the Oasis Center here in Nashville. Donate to all of your local nonprofits that really serve the needs of the community for folks who don't who haven't been given the same opportunities that we have been given, um, that I think is something very concrete um, that we can do. I love that. I love that you're adding in there the donations to Launchpad as well. We had a lot of LGBTQI folks, yeah. homeless. Uh, yeah, this is this is great information. Uh, and you know, and Masha, role models, LGBTQI role models, uh, being representative in leadership, representation matters as well. Uh, keep the dialogue going is what I'm hearing. Educating folks on policies and protections that's shocking to me. The, the queer folk don't know where they're protected, how they're protected, uh, and then where you live matters. And then also, kid, I love how you finish like allyship on multiple levels. Uh, within the LGBTQI community, among other allies, as hetero allies as well. Um, these are wonderful takeaways. Uh, so I, I just want to finish then is just say thank you to Masha and Kit for your expertise. Um, thank you, Lava, for the chance to have this conversation today. Um, if there's no more follow-up comments, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and close this. And thank you, Steph, for great moderation. Thank you. Yep, thank you. <laughs>